Many of you have asked for it. I have been paying attention. I have taken your comments on board and I'm proud to present to you yet another build video. I've been meaning to make this video for quite a long time now, but I typically schedule things in my life so I'm running at a constant level of extremely overwhelmed at all times. So this time we're building a delay pedal because delay pedals are awesome and I chose the cheapest kit available that I could find on Amazon. Hopefully this won't be a deal like last time where as soon as I release the video then they decide they're not going to restock the kit ever again. And hopefully this kit will remain available so people can follow along with the video. I chose this one because I figure there's probably a lot of other amateur pedal builders out there who have chosen the same kit and maybe you got stuck or maybe you just want to see how the kit turns out before you actually purchase it for yourself. So I'm here to answer a few questions, I'm here to demystify the process. This is going to be a longer one, so let's not waste any more time. I'm going to assume you know a few things about soldering, but my recommendations are you have a soldering station with a temperature control. It gives you a lot more consistent heat when you're doing work like this. And I cannot stress enough that you should have a fume extractor. This is a very important step. You don't want to be inhaling all the fumes from the solder. It's simple enough and they're inexpensive. Just put one of these right here in your work area and you won't have to worry about it. I cannot stress the lung safety end of this enough. With the PSA aside, we can carry on. So now, let's go through the parts list. We got resistors. We got capacitors. We have one diode and one light emitting diode, more commonly known as an LED. We have three pots for our three knobs. We have a couple IC chips. One is for the op amp and the other is for the delay processing unit. Got a couple of sockets for our IC chips. You'll see why we need those in a bit. Listed along with the other ICs, we also have a voltage regulator. At first I had actually thought this was a transistor because there's really no visual indication that it's not a transistor. They look almost identical. We've got a DC power jack, we've got a 9 volt battery snap, we've got two quarter inch input output jacks, three knobs, one PCB, that is the printed circuit board, one 3PDT foot switch. So this should be all of our parts. So it doesn't come with much for instructions except for this picture of the board with all the parts listed in their appropriate spot. This could be daunting to beginners, but luckily, this is not my first hot dog race. And I can assure you, this isn't as hard as it seems. We just need to populate the board and solder each piece in its spot. We could literally start anywhere, but I'm choosing to begin with the resistors. It's been a good several months since the last time I soldered anything, and I want to start with something easy that I have replacement parts for. See, some of these parts in the kit we need to be very careful with, but resistors don't have any polarity, which means it doesn't matter which direction they're installed. So all we want to do is just make sure that we're heating the solder pad on the board along with the lead from the component that's sticking through and just hit it with heat for a good few seconds and then touch the solder to it and then the magic should happen and you should have your connection. Again, I'm not going to go too in depth on the soldering here. If you're needing help with soldering, there are plenty other soldering tutorials available on YouTube. And guess what? That's exactly how I learned too. Next, we will move on to the capacitors. This kit comes with three different kinds of capacitors. We have just one tiny ceramic capacitor, several film capacitors, and a couple sizes of electrolytic capacitors. Let's pay special attention to the electrolytic capacitors, as there is one side which is negative and one side which is positive, and they must be installed in the proper orientation. So on the board you will see a small circle where each electrolytic capacitor goes and a small plus sign indicating which side to put the positive post. You can determine which side is positive as it has a longer lead than the negative side. The negative side is also marked with a band of a different color on the body of the capacitor. 
The rest of the capacitors can be installed in any orientation, that is the ceramic capacitor and the film capacitors. As per the brief instructions printed on the board, we must bend some of these over so they lay down flat. I'm assuming this is to make room for the other components later on. We will find out when we get there. So next I will solder in our one single diode. This is another part that we need to install facing the proper direction. You'll notice one side of the diode is marked with a lighter band, and the appropriate spot on the board shows which side this mark should be on. Technically, the LED counts as a diode, of course, but I'm going to wait until later to install that. So let's pop the voltage regulator in here next. You'll notice one side of the body is flat instead of rounded. This must be matched up on the board in order to ensure the part is installed the right way. So we're getting toward the end of our onboard parts. Next we'll add the IC sockets. You should always try to use these sockets when you can, as it protects the IC chips from excessive heat during soldering. You'll notice there is a notch in one end of the socket, which must line up with the graphic printed on the board. I had a little trouble getting the socket to stay in place for soldering, so I got a little piece of masking tape involved. These are a little harder soldering, as the contacts are a bit smaller and closer together. But don't be scared now, just jump on in there and get them done. If we accidentally make a bridge between two of the contacts, it is easy enough to fix with the solder sucker. So to explain what the IC chips are a little bit better, the smaller one is what's known as an op amp, and it does what the name implies, it amplifies an audio source. And the other one is the digital delay processing unit, and it's harder for me to explain exactly how that one works, but that is where most of the functionality of our delay pedal is happening. So you can think of the IC chips just as a block function inside of a box, and then you just hook up the proper inputs and outputs to it to make it work. My explanation on that is probably horrible, and I do recommend that you check out a deeper explanation as to how IC chips work. As a matter of fact, you should probably check out how a lot of these components work anyway, because if building pedals is something you're serious about doing, it's all very useful to know how these parts work and how these parts work with each other. And I'm certainly not coming from a high and mighty mountain here. I'm still learning a lot of this stuff myself, but I'm already able to get in here with build kits and make my own custom effects without having to know every single thing there is to know. I'm assuming that the foot switch is soldered directly to the board, judging by its placement and orientation compared to the pedal enclosure. I temporarily attach the switch to the enclosure to help hold things steady while soldering. There's no wrong way to solder in the 3PDT switch as long as the legs fit through the board easily. The switch in theory operates the same way in forward or reverse. It would appear that the rest of the parts get connected to the board with wires, as we can see several unused spots where wires are supposed to go. This is about the point where I started wishing I had better instructions. The best we get is a few pictures and a rather cryptic numbering system, but after pondering my orb for a while, I had a pretty good idea of what to do. So the next logical step is to solder the provided wires onto the legs of each remaining component. Then once they are all in place, solder the other end of the wires onto the board. A good technique to use here is tinning each wire or each contact with a small amount of solder first before attempting to make a connection. This makes things much easier since you only have two hands and usually gives a cleaner end result with less excess solder. I had a bit of trouble connecting the wires to the pots, but eventually I made it work. Not the prettiest connections, but they are connected. Make note that a certain pot out of our three only needs two wires. All three look similar, but have different values, so make sure you pay attention to which is which. Thankfully, the jacks have a little hole in their contacts, which makes connecting a wire much easier than it was on the pots. 
There appears to be some sort of context on the board very near where the LED is supposed to sit, but I'm not 100% certain if this is a spot I can solder the LED to directly. The ones that are actually labeled LED are very far apart, which would lead us to believe that we are supposed to use wires, but there are not enough wires provided in the kit. Now, I could easily make my own jumper wires, but the lack of wires in the kit makes it seem less likely that this was the intended method. So after fussing with it for a while, I opted to make two more jumper wires to connect the LED. This may not have been necessary, but I chose to play it safe and not make an assumption. I did a little improvisation here and found that my nail clippers work much better than my dull scissors. <laughs> I'm trying to cut through only the outer layer of insulation and pull it away to expose the bare wire within. It is of course important to make note that the side of the LED with the shorter leg is the negative side, and then be sure we install it correctly. And in this process I had a ton of trouble trying to connect these wires to the LED, but eventually I found success. We have all of our wires soldered onto all of our remaining components. Excellent. Referencing the names for the knobs printed on the enclosure, we can make a pretty good guess as to which pot goes where. D for delay, V for volume, and R for repeats, which should be called feedback. So next I add the LED and the battery clip, which both go quite a bit easier. Just match up the positive and negative sides and you're all set. Only a few more pieces now. I hook up the input and output jacks as well as the DC power jack. Again, I'm just matching up the wording on the instructions to the remaining spots on the board. It's my best interpretation that the DC jack's lead, labeled PWC, and the ring of the input jack have to be soldered into the same hole. So that's how I will do it, and I hope this is the right move. I found this to be slightly easier after I stripped both wires back a little further and twisted them together and tinned them with a little bit of solder. And there's the last few wires for the input and output jacks. With all of the soldering done, it is now safe to plug the IC chips into their appropriate sockets. One end of the chip has a little notch, which must be lined up with the notch on the socket. If there is no notch, there will be a little dot instead. Putting the IC chip in backwards can make very bad things happen. The legs on these chips are very easy to bend, so you'll need to use a lot of patience and finesse to get them properly seated in the socket. Do not use a lot of force unless you are sure things are lining up right. So I don't like the boring stock look of the pedal enclosure and being a painter by trade, I just gotta give it a custom paint job. <laughs> so now we'll switch over to phone quality video and I'll just run through the painting process and fast forward really quick. If you want a detailed breakdown of my painting process, follow the link down below to my Hydro Dip guitar pedal tutorial video. So first we sand it, then we clean it, then we make a handle out of tape and attach that to the inside, and then we spray a base coat to act as a primer. Fill a container with water, spray alternating colors onto the surface of the water, slowly dip the pedal enclosure, swirl the water, and remove. Once the paint has had a good long time to dry and cure, we can mount all of the jacks and pots and then pray that the pedal works properly. So I start by removing all the nuts and washers from everything and keeping them safely nearby. 
It was not very long before I realized that I made a critical oopsie on the DC in jack. I have to get our old pal, the solder sucker, involved once more, remove as much solder as I can, and try to remove the three wires cleanly. Considering that the nut goes on the inside of the enclosure. I should have attached it to the box before I soldered on the wires, which is definitely more difficult, but in this case, our only choice. Some additional solder sucking might be needed to clear the holes in the contacts again. It's possible to reattach them without holes, but I am a noob. This part usually stresses me out a lot, to be honest. Being gentle on all the solder joints and routing all the wires neatly, trying very hard not to get frustrated and start stuffing them in willy-nilly. See, the problem we're running into here is that the board only connects to the enclosure in one spot where the foot switch pokes through. The board is being pushed upward on the top edge, and the more you tighten the nut on the foot switch, the worse our problem gets. If you just force it closed how it is and tighten everything down, Contact with the metal enclosure will short-circuit everything on the board and likely damage the IC chips. So I just found a random piece of plastic and taped it to the back plate with electrical tape. So the board will sit more level inside of the enclosure once everything is closed up and there will be an insulated barrier between all of our solder points and the metal case. I will reiterate that I am a noob and I improvise a lot while I do stuff like this. So if anyone can tell me if this is a bad idea and why, that would be excellent actually. So now it's finally time to test it. Send me all of your thoughts and prayers. We hope it works flawlessly with no redos. <laughs> All of our prayers have been answered and the pedal works perfectly. Last step is to attach the knobs. Just make sure you turn the pots all the way down first and line the knobs up so they look right before you tighten them down. So if I had to give a brief review of the kit, I would say that it's decent at best. Definitely pretty good for the price point, um, the audio quality is all right it's definitely a delay pedal it sounds okay there's not a lot of really fine adjustment to the delay time so just like one little teeny tiny turn of the knob will give you quite a bit of difference it's the quality of the kit it definitely feels like a cheap kit it definitely feels like a cheap pedal i don't really like the knobs i think the knobs are kind of oversized the enclosure is very small for this circuit and for how much wiring is required, so it's just a mess trying to stuff all this stuff back into the case. It's kind of cramped and hard to work on with everything being as small as it is. And the instructions are also pretty vague. I think that for a beginner, as I mentioned, you'd have a hard time getting through this without a little bit more guidance. 
that's my review. It sounds all right. It was kind of hard to do, but you get what you pay for. It's my intention to eventually do another video where I modify this circuit. It's not really an awesome delay on its own, but it could have some potential as some sort of a weird glitchy noise box. Stuff that sounds bad generally fits well into my style of music, so I'm willing to give it a try. So I have a few ideas for this already, hopefully I'm not over promising things again, but stay tuned and hit that subscribe button if you feel like I've earned it. That is all for this video and I hope you all enjoyed. Quick shout out to my Patreon supporters John Johnson and AJ Barbour, you guys are the absolute best, and as always, have fun out there.